Hi all, this is Mike the Nonviolent Warrior, and today I'm going to be talking to you about equipment and strategy considerations for attending a nonviolent protest and getting home safely. To begin with, an important disclaimer, I am not a lawyer or legal expert, I'm not a police officer or ex-cop or anything like that, so take any uh, advice that I give you with a grain of salt, do your own research, familiarize yourself with your own local laws, and if in doubt, consult a lawyer. Do not in any way take any kind of legal advice from me. That's on you and a bad idea. So without further ado, I'm first gonna talk about kind of strategy and philosophical considerations for attending a nonviolent protest. And then I'll talk through gear recommendations. To begin with, we define our mission from which all of our equipment and strategy, tactic, technique considerations are going to be derived. Uh, the mission for a nonviolent protest is to attend the protest, to demonstrate nonviolently, and then to get home safe. Everything that we decide ahead of time and everything that we do at the protest should be motivated and determined by this mission. So let's break the mission down into its two separate parts. The first part, attending and demonstrating nonviolently. Obviously, we wouldn't be having this discussion if your goal wasn't to attend a demonstration and demonstrate nonviolently. Uh, thus, it's a part of our mission, and your equipment selection should reflect that. Now, historically, nonviolence has been an extremely effective way to affect change in institutional systems. Uh, ironically, nonviolence is often met with violence by police or the powers that be or by other interest groups, which often contributes to the effect of nonviolence. As an example, video of police using high-powered hoses and sicking dogs on civil rights protesters in Birmingham, Alabama in 1962 outraged the nation and really helped pave the way for the passage of the Civil Rights Act two years later. The unfortunate thing about nonviolent demonstration is that oftentimes uh, it is met by violence from external forces. Uh, in order for nonviolence to really be effective, it needs to be something that you commit to. Uh, that's difficult to do, it's difficult to say, uh, and I can't control what you actually do at a demonstration but I can try to give you some guidelines to help keep you safe and help you get home safe. And that's really what this video is about. So the second key point of the mission is to get home safe. Uh, getting home safe goes beyond just physically returning to your house safe. It also means that a week later, the FBI isn't knocking on your door to arrest you. Uh, this means a couple things. One, that you don't do anything while demonstrating that should get you arrested. I cannot in any way and don't condone that. Um, but two, that you don't make it too easy for uh, authorities to identify you among a crowd. Uh, and that comes down, again, to gear selection, uh, equipment selection, clothing selection, whatever you want to call it, um, and also just your behavior. Uh, I can't control what you do at a protest, as I said, uh, but um, I, I really think that nonviolence is the most effective, or at least oftentimes the most effective form of protest or demonstration in order, in order to affect large-scale social and civil changes. And I think it requires really committing uh, to that uh, to make it work effectively. Now let's get down to actually attending a demonstration nonviolently. The first step is before the demonstration, preparation. First of all, try to, try to find out where the demonstration is going to be, where it's going to be moving, if it's moving, uh, or where it's just going to gather in general and map out the area. Go to Google Maps or whatever your preference is. Uh, look at the streets, look at the buildings around it. Uh, try to keep track of where alleyways are. Basically just familiarize yourself with the terrain ahead of time. Sometimes this might be the only thing that you can do to familiarize yourself with the terrain ahead of time. Ideally, you can move on to the next step, which is to actually go out and walk the route or walk the areas where you're gonna be gathering. Uh, this is important so that you familiarize yourself physically with the location but it also helps you to establish a baseline on what to expect to see there. Baselines and anomalies I'll talk about in another video, but the idea is you wanna have kind of a visual image in your mind, a mental picture of what that area should look like so that you can identify when things are you know, particularly out of place. Uh, so pay attention to things like where trash is collected, uh, where cars are parked. Keep in mind that these things may change, may just be cleared out by the city in preparation for an event. At the event, you're gonna to wanna to look for things where they shouldn't be, basically, to try to keep yourself safe, try to avoid potential dangers. Walk the area, walk the back alleys, maybe try to kind of identify some routes to move through the area, alternate routes to get out. Uh, and that comes down to the third point, which is plan your escape routes ahead of time. 
Uh, if things really get violent and you don't want to become a victim of that, vi of that violence, you need to be able to get out. And authorities may be blocking one or more directions out of the site. Uh, so it's important to go there ahead of time and, uh, and familiarize yourself with multiple ways to get out of the immediate area and get to transportation, either your own vehicle or the nearest bus stop or train or whatever, uh, to uh, leave and get somewhere safe. Uh, everything comes down to getting home safe. Obviously, the demonstration is part of our mission, uh, but our mission ends with getting home safe. Finally, it may be a good idea ahead of time to write down some phone numbers that you might need later. Uh, a lot of people recommend writing the phone number for the ACLU in permanent marker in multiple places on your body so that it doesn't rub off everywhere. I also recommend keeping a list of important contacts somewhere on your body. Uh, these should be a lawyer if you have one, an emergency contact, uh, somebody who knows where you are going and is expecting you home safe. And keep in mind, in the event that you are arrested, uh, that first call goes out to your lawyer or the ACLU, not your mama. Now let's talk about the equipment choices for attending a nonviolent protest and demonstrating nonviolently. Keep in mind our equipment is selected based on our mission. So our equipment is selected to allow us to demonstrate nonviolently, physically protect us while we're there, and get us home safe. So equipment selection with the mission of attending a protest nonviolently and getting home safe. I'm going to start with uh, clothing, pretty much working from the bottom up. I'm gonna talk about a bag with some emergency equipment in it, and then I'm gonna talk about additional safety gear that you may want to consider. To start with, some general considerations. One, you wanna avoid anything that's too recognizable, anything with big logos on it, or bright colors, anything that's very obviously from a rare brand or something. Two, I recommend not going too tactical. This is for two reasons. One, tactical stuff tends to stand out. It might kind of make you a target. And two, if you go in there looking like some tactical ninja, uh, authorities may consider you a possible instigator. You may actually inadvertently find yourself escalating the conflict, which you don't want. Use what you have, but I recommend nothing too tactical, nothing too bright. Everything that I'm going to show you is pretty much neutral colors, not terribly identifiable. Okay, so starting from the feet, I recommend not specifically these shoes, but just some sturdy shoes that you can move around in uh, that will protect your feet if somebody steps on you or you have to walk over broken glass, uh, but that provide support, uh, are comfortable for hours standing and walking and moving, and that you can move fast in if you need to. Uh, I use trail running shoes, or I also have some kind of just like gym shoes that I'll wear. Uh, again, I don't recommend going too tactical on like heavy duty military boots or something, but uh, you know, work boots are probably not a bad idea either. I also recommend a good pair of socks. Uh, these are darn tough kind of hiking socks. They're sort of medium weight. Weight of the sock is going to depend on, you know, the weather and your current condition. Here it's fairly cold right now. Next, for pants, I recommend something, again, neutral colored. Uh, these are kind of like climbing pants. They're fairly stretchy and durable, uh, but jeans work just as well. Just something that's relatively incognito. Uh, it's going to cover your legs protect you a little bit from the elements and from, you know, abrasions, that sort of thing. Moving on up, a belt. I recommend a nice sturdy belt, something with a good buckle. This one actually has Velcro. It's like a real low profile, uh, it's actually a gun belt, but very low profile. For two reasons. One, you don't want your pants falling down. Two, you never know when somebody might have to drag you out of a bad situation by your belt. It's good to be able to rely on it if you need it. Moving on up, the base layer. This is a small lightweight base layer that's long sleeved. I like layering, but I like layering in neutral tones so that if it gets really hot or really cold, I can always remove or add layers appropriately. Next, an outer layer. This is just a hoodie. I recommend something, again, neutral toned, not too tactical, but maybe a little bulky. And I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk about why when we get to the safety equipment. Moving up the body to the face. COVID-19 is going on right now. You all know the drill. Uh, guys, wear your masks. Uh, I feel like there's no excuse not to. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple piece of safety equipment that keeps yourself and others safe. I recommend a couple different styles of masks. Uh, obviously, you've got like your typical kind of just tie on or over the ear COVID mask. Uh, I also really like a Shema to act A as a mask, but B as a broad face cover to kind of hide your features, protect your, uh, protect your identity. I will honestly go to events and wear both of these. I'll layer them. Uh, that way, if I lose the broad face cover, my face is still covered from both COVID as well as potential identification. Broad face covers, shamas are great. You can look up lots of videos about how to tie them. 
Continuing up the head, we have safety glasses. I guess this would really go into safety equipment, except that I don't consider it optional. If pepper balls start flying or gas canisters are going through the air or whatever, uh, you're, if you get hit in the eye with one of those, you're probably gonna be blind. So wear safety glasses, keep them on the whole time. You can get ones that are shaded or not shaded. Uh, just protect your eyes, it's important. Next up, uh, we have a hat. Uh, I like to cover my head. Uh, the hat helps keep the sun out a little bit, keep your eyes, uh, you know, from going blind or whatever. It's also fairly decent for kind of light disguise, being incognito, that kind of thing. So I definitely recommend wearing a hat, something, again, sturdy, not a lot of obvious branding on it or anything like that, just something that doesn't really stand out. There are some alternatives for a hat that we'll get into when we talk about safety equipment. The one other recommendation I have on clothes is some kind of outer layer that you can throw on to dramatically change your appearance. Uh, this would be something that you shove into your backpack, which we'll talk about in a second. You can always pull it out, put it on, while you kind of escape the area if needed. All right, next we'll talk about what's gonna be in our pockets. Uh, I don't like to carry much in my pockets at these sorts of events. Uh, for one, you might lose it. I feel like uh, my cell phone and things like that, for instance, are uh, more secure in my backpack. And I'll talk about my other considerations there in a minute. A flashlight is often a good idea, uh, especially if you expect that it's gonna get dark. If you end up finding yourself having to run away through alleys that you're not familiar with at night, having something that you can use to light your way is really important. And in a pinch, uh, you can use it as a striking implement uh, I am the nonviolent warrior, but I'll talk about this in another video. I do recognize that uh, nonviolence is not always the answer. Another option is a coupaton. Uh, when we start talking about weapons on your person at, a, uh, at an event, though, uh, you start getting into some potential legal issues. For instance, if you're found committing a crime with a weapon on your person, I believe that in some states at least you can be charged additional for that, whether you employ a weapon or not. Uh, coupons are pretty, uh, pretty benign. Uh, it's essentially a, a striking weapon. You can use it for pain compliance and that kind of thing as well. Uh, and it, you can also use like a tactical pin. I would recommend nothing too tactical. If you just have a decently sturdy metal pin, you can at least make the claim that that's just for taking notes. While we're on the topic, pepper spray. Again, pepper spray is not a lethal weapon, uh, but it is still a weapon. You might find yourself in some, some, uh, some quandaries there if you are caught in a, uh, in a protest that is declared unlawful with a weapon on you. Uh, again, I'm not, a I'm not a lawyer or a legal expert. I can't give you any legal advice. Just keep in mind, you want to familiarize yourself with your local laws before you carry anything that could be construed as a weapon into one of these events. Uh, second of all, you want to think about when or why you may need to use something like this. Uh, personally, I would leave the pepper spray at home, just take the flashlight. Talking about things in your pockets, I would be remiss if I didn't mention firearms. Uh, I'm not even going to bother bringing mine out, but uh, I would not carry to one of these events. Uh, for similar considerations to what I talked about uh, with the other things, but if you feel compelled to do so, just be aware that you may be taking on additional risk because you're in possession of a firearm, legally or not, at a demonstration, uh, if that demonstration is declared unlawful. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know all the details, uh, but just keep it in mind. Another consideration for your pockets would be like a pocket knife or even like a small fixed blade knife. Uh, this is just a camping knife that I have from Essie, or Rowan knives, Essie knives, yeah, Essie knives. Um, that's a super sturdy, great little pocket knife, utility knife. However, as with a gun, carrying a knife to a nonviolent protest may open you up to additional legal liabilities, maybe moral liabilities. Uh, I would think personally long and hard before I decided to carry a knife to an event like this. Uh, so probably better off just leaving it at home. So we talked about what's, uh, what you're wearing. Now let's talk about what you're carrying on your back. I carry a backpack. It's not a very big one, it's something like 20 liters. Again, something relatively nondescript. I do have these reflective tapes on here that I'd probably remove in the uh, event that I was going to a, an event. Just enough space to carry what you really need. I have a couple things that are already in here. I'll talk about those. First thing I keep in my backpack is an IFAC, uh, individual first aid kit. I'll put some links in the show notes about uh, how to uh, build one of these. Uh, my IFAC, this is kind of my little portable one, so it's not nearly as uh, complete as my home one. I have a pressure bandage. I have some chest seals, general boo-boo kit stuff. 
uh, some stuff for making bandages or improvising them. I have a tourniquet, uh, some gloves, rubber gloves, or nitrile gloves, I think. Um, just some basic things uh, to help stabilize somebody in the event of a lot of bleeding or uh, other traumatic injuries. Uh, IFAC, for me anyway, just goes in the bottom of the kit. There we have it. Uh, also part of the IFAC are my safety shears, which I just keep in the bag, kind of tucked into the top up here. Uh, right there, I think. Uh, I also have a multi-tool. Uh, I'd really consider whether or not I want to bring this to an event before I go. I might take it out just because it has a blade on it. And again, you might be opening yourself up to some other risks when carrying a blade into one of these events. The next thing in the bag, I like to keep a notebook and a pen. Uh, you never know when you might need to write something down, write down the details of a crime that you witnessed or abuse of power, that kind of thing. So good idea to have a notebook and a pen with you. You can also take notes ahead of time as to like where you would go in the event of an emergency, that kind of thing. You could keep your phone list in there. Um, notebook and pen. Next one, I would keep an additional hat, maybe an additional uh, face covering, more things that you can use to kind of change your appearance if needed. Uh, also weather appropriate gear. My cell phone and any credit cards I have, my watch, things like that, anything that can transmit, I put into one of these little uh, kind of blackout bags. This one's from Mission Darkness. Uh, they make a lot of different sizes. They work really well. This is pretty important when you're going to an event if you are worried about police state using your information or whatever to later link you to something that they've declared unlawful uh, just because they can. Turn your phones off, turn your watches off, put your phones, your cards, anything that can transmit inside one of these, and then I just tuck this into the bag like that. Next, I keep a sports bottle, uh, specifically something that I can squirt water out of. In the event that you get hit with tear gas, uh, the ability to kind of get some pressure behind the water is really useful in washing that stuff out of your eyes. Might do another video later on essentially how to take care of tear gas if you get hit with it, but um, or pepper spray, whatever. Thoroughly rinsing with water with some pressure uh, is typically just about the fastest way to get rid of it. Uh, I also, I didn't have it with me today, I also uh, typically carry would carry a water bladder to an event uh, just to hydrate myself. This is really used for emergencies. Now we're starting to get into some safety equipment, so this is a bit of a preview for what's to come. Uh, gloves, very important. These are just ironclad work gloves off of Amazon or something. Uh, but I keep these accessible. I either clip them to the carabiner here or I just uh, shove them in an outside pocket so that I always know where they are. Uh, honestly, I would, I would probably wear them more often than not. Uh, for one, it protects your hands if you take a fall and have to brace yourself keeps it from uh, skinning your hands on the asphalt. Uh, two, just pretty much anything that you have to do with your hands is easier to do when you don't have to worry about hurting your hands. An additional consideration with gloves uh, is if you find yourself having to throw tear gas canisters away from the crowd, those things get real hot. So you want something that kind of protects you from heat, protects you from abrasions and sharp things, that kind of stuff. Gloves are important. Next in the bag is either a half face respirator or a full face respirator, and I would honestly take the full face if you have it, for the event that uh, chemical irritants are being deployed. Uh, full face respirator is better than half face just because it you know, seals all the way around. You don't have the potential of air leaking or chemicals leaking between the half face respirator and any goggles that you might wear. It helps protect your eyes as well from you know, debris and that kind of stuff. Uh, so full face respirator, I would highly recommend as almost necessary safety equipment. Finally, we mentioned this outer layer. Uh, this might not be the one that I would take, but this thing's pretty puffy, pretty squishable, so we can just kind of squish in there. Everything squishes down. You can pretty easily fit it all. And that's just about everything I would keep in my bag. Not bad, not too heavy. Uh, as far as the bag itself, I would recommend something that A, can fit everything that you need comfortably, uh, B, uh, that you can carry for a long period of time on your feet comfortably and uh, see if it's not gonna like break or give out on you and not terribly descript, something that doesn't really stand out in a crowd, something that maybe isn't too tactical. Uh, this one's from uh, Goruck. Uh, it's not the cheapest bag out there, but I like them because they are very durable uh, and I don't think they look too tactical or really too uh, uh, obvious what they are. They just kind of look nondescript. I like the bag. 
Finally, we have some uh, additional safety considerations. First of all, a helmet. Uh, I recommend, honestly, just a bump helmet. Again, maybe nothing too tactical, but if you have a tactical helmet, if you've got a ballistic helmet from your service days or whatever, uh, you know, go ahead and wear that if you want to. Uh, I just think the tactical helmets may make you more of a target than you intend. Uh, I don't really recommend ballistic helmets. They're way more expensive than a good bump helmet. Uh, and generally speaking, I think getting shot is a lower probability uh, than getting shot with a bullet is a lower probability than, for instance, pepper balls or getting hit in the head with a baton. Falling and hitting your head is a very likely event. Uh, so this is just a snowboarding helmet. Again, it's cold here right now, so this is fine for me, but in warmer weather, I would probably wear a bike helmet or something like that. Um, but something to protect your head. This thing works great. Next up, knee pads. Uh, again, pretty much protecting you from falls. Uh, also, if you do find yourself getting arrested, you might have to kneel on the concrete for a long time. That kind of sucks if uh, you don't have something protecting your knees. So knee pads are good. I would wear them under your clothes if you can. Again, to make yourself less of a target, make yourself uh, not stand out too much. Along the same lines as the knee pads, you've got padded shorts. Uh, these are great for, again, taking a fall on your butt, absorb some of the impact and also might help absorb some impact if you get hit by a baton or something like that in the legs. So these are useful to have, useful to wear. Again, wear them under your pants if you can. Elbow and forearm pads. Unfortunately, I only have these kind of soft elbow pads right now. I don't have any like nicer forearm pads at this time, but uh, elbow pads, mostly to protect against falls. Forearm pads, really to protect against uh, police batons. Uh, broken arms and things like that are fairly common injuries at uh, protests that the police decide to break up violently. You can kind of see why police swing a baton, you try to block it with your forearms, break your forearms. Uh, having a, you know, something like, a, something like soccer shin pads for your forearms would be great. Something with a little rigidity to help kind of spread that impact out would, you know, help really protect yourself while you're trying to protect yourself from force. Again, wear them under your clothes if you can. Finally, uh, this is one that, you know, is kind of up in the air, but if you think that things might really get nasty, uh, body armor may be appropriate. Um, this is a nice kind of low profile plate carrier by 511. Uh, it's got, you know, three plus plates in it, level three plus plates. It's not too heavy. I think total it's maybe 15 pounds, maybe a little less. I can wear it under a shirt, under a, a bulkier sweater, which is why I recommend wearing something that's at least a little bit bulky on the outside. I wouldn't put it on top if you can avoid it, but if all you have is a plate carrier that you can't really put under your clothes and you think it's necessary, it's probably better to bring it than not. Um, again, this one's gonna be really situational. It's gonna be dependent on what you feel comfortable with uh, and how big of a threat you think possible gunfire is. Uh, most of the time I'd say you can probably leave it at home, but I'd hate to say that and have something terrible happen. So uh, plate carrier is an option. Okay, so there you have my uh, recommendations for what to take to a nonviolent protest, as well as some considerations about uh, attending a nonviolent protest and getting home safe. Uh, a couple of things that I forgot to mention in the bag, I would bring uh, a little extra food, help keep yourself fueled up, maybe some granola bars, something like that, and enough cash to get home safe. So if you have an estimate of what taxis would cost or an Uber, although for that you probably need your phone, uh, buses, trains, whatever you got, uh, just bring enough cash to get yourself home safe. So that's pretty much it right now. In future videos, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what to look out for as far as threats go, how to respond to those, what the priorities, in my opinion, should be on uh, how you react to things in order to get yourself home safe. Uh, again, kind of keep into that mission of attending the protest, demonstrating nonviolently, and getting home safe. Until next time, I am Mike the Nonviolent Warrior. If you liked what you saw, please hit subscribe, and thank you for watching.